Since I'm my own host, I will not introduce myself, uh, besides saying that, uh, as you can tell from the subject, I'm interested in mathematics. Now, this loaded word, theoretical, I put here on purpose to make clear that uh, this is interesting theory. For reasons that I'm going to explain, I don't believe this particular thing has immediate glaring applications. It's more of nice to know. Now, it is related to very practical things. I did write uh, quite a successful program to find the uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, however, the practical aspects are different. The reason why I chose to talk about this is because of the mathematical interest. It's, a in my opinion, a very beautiful theory. So, let's go. First, introducing the problem. And I introduce it by an example. Suppose that we are given a set of uh, in, in bit sequences. And uh, most of them are pretty random. But there are few, say there is a pair, I put in them here one next to the other so that the comparison is easy, that are more likely to be the same than the rest. So the way to find it is that if we go through all the pairs and compare between each pair, compute the Hamming distance, we'll find that this pair is exceptionally close. Now, when you are talking about uh, small numbers, of course, going through all the pairs is very easy. But uh, when you have tens of millions, and if we'll be able to, maybe even billions of things, then uh, you, you need to do something better than uh, looking at all pairs, because there are just too many pairs. So, this is the general problem. Now, here I can define a very particular model problem by saying that, all right, I have n sequences of bits. The bits are random with probability half zero, half one. And there is one special pair so such that the probability that bits are similar is not a half, but p, where p is greater than half. So uh, the way to present is this, there is a probability matrix of showing in that special pair the, if you have the probability of having zero both here and there is p over two, one the same, while, while having zero in one and zero in one sequence and one in the other sequence is one minus p over two. Now this matrix tells the probability of the special pair, but if you are computing the marginal probabilities, meaning summing this and this, we have half, summing this and this, we have half. So that pertains to all those sequences that have probability half, half. So this one matrix encodes how such a thing is generated. All right. Now, this is an example problem completely defined. Now, what do we know about it? First thing is that we need enough data in order to be able to pinpoint the correct pair, even uh, if nobody limits our computation. Because it could be that we just can, can't, can't tell it. If P is close to a half, for instance, it will, it will be. So, uh, wh when, when can we do it? So we have information theory. The amount of information in the pair is uh, about uh, 2 log n or log of n square or half n square. Now, the amount of information that I, get, that I have in each single bit is uh, the information a function of p. Well, well known function, so it is uh, zero when p is a half, no information, up to uh, log two when p is one, which is the perfect thing. Now we have d bits, so the total information is d. 
times i of p. So I take the difference. Now, what does this number mean? If, if this is negative, it means that, yes, I have enough information to pinpoint the pair. If it's positive, it means, no, I can't pinpoint it, but maybe I can restrict it. I can restrict it to a, to a size of n possibilities. This is standard information theory. Of course, the question is uh, how, uh, computational. How much effort do I need to do? So this is, again, standard. So uh, what, what, what we do is that uh, we randomly select a subset of the coordinates, subset of k coordinates, where k is about log base 2 of n. Why that? Because we are going to look at the values in these coordinates. The, how, the number of values possible is 2 to the k, which would be approximately n. So it means that each of the sequences uh, will uh, get sort of a place of its own. So, think of, so we have buckets. The buckets, uh, we throw in a sequence to the bucket according to the value of its coordinates. So let me go back. So if, if I take uh, the bucket to be the first three coordinates, you see that this one and this one would fall to the same bucket. And together with this, this is a bucket of size at least three. Here I have another bucket of size one, and here I have another bucket of size one. Ah, okay. The little n is the thing that uh, we are going to see a lot. This is the, the number of objects between which we are trying to find the pairs. Uh, the big N is uh, sort of a flinting acquaintance. It is when I'm looking at the information theory, how many possibilities of, of, for, for a pairing I have left once I analyze, fully analyze the data. So it's the difference between the necessary amount of information that I want in order to determine a pair and the amount of information that I have. In most cases, um, the, this uh, difference is negative. So though it's written as a big N, it's actually a very small number. Another question. So the, uh, in the probability matrix, the probability should sum to one, right? Yes. The, but you have it divided by two. Um, because um, here, P plus 1 minus p is 1 divided by 2, so this sum is a half, this sum is a half, and together the sum is 1. Now, this is not a transition matrix. It's a, it's a, it's a probability matrix. All right. So we, we saw that we are, we are choosing random k coordinates. And there, the, what, what are the chances that the two members of the pair will indeed fall into the same basket? Uh, it's p to the k, because the, the, the chance that they agree on a single coordinate is p, which is about n to the log base 2 of p. So th th this, this is a probability. It, it could be quite small. And this is uh, the chance that one try that we made, we chose those coordinates, we threw into baskets. What are the chances that we found something? The chances are something. So in order to be able to find the correct pair, we have to make several tries. In each try, we randomly pick some subsets of coordinates and throw into baskets. How many tries do we need to, to do? Exactly the inverse of this number. So that's the number of tries. Now, in each try, on the average, we have to make n comparisons. Because in each basket, we expect very few elements. One, two, no more. So number of comparison would be of order of n. So altogether, the number of comparisons that we need is n times this, which is together n to the log base 2 of 2 over p. 
So we can, we can check now that if P is one, that uh, everything is perfect, then this is the work is of order N, which is means we, we just have to go and read the data. This is the best case. The worst case when P is a half, then this is N square, meaning we have to go and compare everything. We can't do anything. So these are the extremes and the probability goes between them. Now, I highlighted here two things that I want to uh, stress. One, why do I talk about comparisons? I mean, you, you would say that the natural unit would be just, say, bit operations. Uh, the, re the reason why I talk about comparisons is uh, because, uh, for instance, if, if D, the length of the sequences, is very, very long, and we would say that then when, when we go and compare one to another, it's work D, then you would say that the work goes uh, to infinity with D. But actually, we need to take only few of them till that we are certain. So usually we just have, need to take a logarithmic number. Also, it could be that the data is sparse, so that we have an efficient representation. So I, I, I don't, so this is the reason why I don't want to go, to go and count how actually I'm making the comparisons. I'm just counting the comparisons. This is one thing. The other is that I'm claiming that this analysis is valid only when the amount of data that I have, the length of the sequences, is, is large. Why is that? I mean, apparently what I did before is relevant no matter what this is. The reason why this is necessary is that the analysis that we did is correct once we make our first try. But when we make our second try, we might pick on the same coordinate. So that the, our, our tries are not independent. So when these large, they are independent. And then when it's valid. When these small, they are dependent and the actual uh, expression is more complicated. All right, so this is the basic uh, pro uh, model problem and it's a standard simple solution. And this is the foundation for everything else. So if there is question about this, better ask it now. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, okay. when well, I'm saying standard, meaning there is nothing uh, that I've contributed here in any way. I'm just presenting uh, the basics. It's uh, yes, it's it's well known for a long time, uh, definitely. Yes. How do you term a change when you have not bits, but? All right. So. You, you, can, you can see that you can do the same thing if we had, instead of bits, uh, three possibilities, so on, uh, it, it, it wouldn't matter. Now, what would matter, of course, if you are getting to a more complicated matrix? And, uh, and then, when the matrix is small enough, you can say that things work sort of the same principle, but they're just more complicated. But you can go to extreme cases and have continuous distributions, etc. And then, though some of the principles remain, uh, it might be quite hard uh, to work the analysis in practice. Um, this, like many other things, uh, this is an analogy to what you have in information theory. Information theory, they start to present you those nice bit examples, but then somewhere further the way of electrical engineers working with all those continuous signals. So in principle, you could have this here too. All right, we started with one example. Now, I want to present another example. This is a very important example. And this, uh, you, would, you wouldn't find uh, so prominent in the literature. And so this is sparse data. Now, uh, the kind of problem that I worked with is a sparse data problem. And I believe that this sort of problem is very, very common. So um, the matrix there is something of this nature. What does it mean? It means that most times we have zeros. 
zero, zeros everywhere with a very large probability. And the probability, to, so that uh, if you look at the marginal probability, one minus two epsilon zero and just two epsilons once. All right, now, what's your impression? Suppose that you are given a, a large amount of data, as, D as large as you wish. Is this problem easier or harder than the previous problem with a reasonable P, say P three quarters? What's your intuition? You want to say it's harder than <laughs> ah, of course. Well, this, the surprising thing, or not so surprising, if you think about it, it's actually easier. There is power in, in uh, sparsity. And uh, I, w I want to show you why. So, again, I'm sh I'm, the method that I'm presenting is a standard method that's done long before me. It's usually attributed to broader though actually there is an earlier uh, a publication of uh, Udi Manber that somehow uh, he didn't get his, his name attached to it. But uh, he says that uh, he went to search and uh, he, he, he got, on the whole he's not sorry that he went to search. But <laughs> this, this should be attributed to him too. And uh, again, the, the approach is bucketing. But here, you have to be a bit more careful because if you just take a random subset of coordinates, it might well be that they're all zero because there are so many zeros. So you, you want to have sort of a certain number of ones. Now, a good practical way to, arra to arrange it is the following. You rearrange the coordinates in some random way and then for each of the sequences you look, where are the ones starting in, in that order? So the first one is here, the second one is there, the third one is there, and you're looking at the K of them. And the locations of those this case, this is, this is what determines the bucket. It's a very, it's a very, very reasonable system. Now, Let's, um, let, 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 let's see how it performs. Th this is actually um, an, an, an upper bound. I'm not trying to compute exactly how it performs, but showing that it does at least this well. So uh, we, the, num the number of uh, coord coordinates that we take is log n divided by log 2 epsilon. Why is that? Because... Um, What's the probability that two unrelated points fall into the same bucket? Those, uh, it, could, the, it could depend on a large number of coordinates, but, uh, but we know that at least k of them, so look at the first, at least k of these are ones. Now these ones, they must be ones also in the other. So the probability is at most two epsilon to the k. Now this choice of k is so that this is order of one over n. So that again, we, expe we expect the buckets to be of a small size. Now, when we do this, now what's, what's the probability that two related sequences fall into the same bucket? Well, let's look at the first m coordinates. m is arbitrary, I can choose it whatever I want. Now, if I know that those two agree on those m values and that k of them are ones, then it's fine. So we have at least the probability of choosing those k ones out of m. This is the probability of having those two values ones, the probability of having those two epsilon. Well, not the most pleasant expression in the world, though we'll see much worse. And. Um, we can, we can rewrite it like this, which looks even worse, but the point here is that a, a choice of m, a reasonable choice, this is so that the expected number will be k, gives this binomial expression that is a sort of order uh, unity or one over m. So 
you do the, the computation gives that the amount of work is like this. You have n to the one plus something which is small. Now this is what I want to stress. The larger epsilon is, the smaller this addition and the better we are. Now, even though, notice that each one, the probability is, suppose that I know that there is one here. The probability is it's preserved in the other sequence is just a half. Nevertheless, because those things are so rare, I can make a, a, ver a very good determination. They are very powerful indicators. Now, also a thing to note is that, uh, ag again, the you can think of the distances here as humming distances, but um, if you look at the probabilities, really quite funny things happen. So for instance, the sequence that with no ones whatsoever is as close in probability to something as itself. Because you see that here, this epsilon and this epsilon are the same. And we could, of course, say, take an example of making this, say, two epsilon, and then it would be even worse. So the metric considerations uh, bec become a bit tricky. It's not, it's, not, it's not really right to look at it as a metric space at all. All right, so this is the, this is the sparse example. Any questions about it? All right. Now, since I put that word theory in, there is no way for me to avoid mentioning the leading theory attached to the subject. Most papers take this approach. And if I don't mention it, uh, I would be asked, uh, well, how do you compare with this? Now, the, the, the approach that I take is a probabilistic while this approach is worst case. So uh, it's apples and oranges in one sense. Nevertheless, there are some comparisons to be made. So what this theory says, it, actually it, the algorithm that it's based, it's uh, even a simpler version of the bucketing algorithm that we saw at first, except that coordinates are chosen with replacement. So we can have the same coordinate chosen a few times which seems a bad idea, but it makes the analysis easier because then you have independent choice. Um, and what turns out is the, is the following. Suppose that, that you, have, you have a problem of trying to find the nearest neighbors and uh, there is a ratio C between the random distance, distance between just two points anywhere, and the distance of the right pair. Now, if you, have, if you have this ratio C, then the work, you can do it work n to the 1 plus 1 over C. So the larger C is, the larger the ratio between the random distance and a pair distance, the better you can do. Now, this, this is sort of a quote. I mean, I don't, I'm not showing why it is, though, though it's quite simple. Um, now, also, the, 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 there is a lower bound, quite, a, quite an interesting paper. And this lower bound is actually valid not only from this point of view, but also from the random point of view. And it shows that in some sense, under some assumptions, you cannot do better than a power which also goes near one when C gets large. Now, let's see how it does in the particular examples that we saw so far. So in the first example, the, the, the ratio, it's very easy to compute because the random distance is half D. Two random points will agree in half and will be different in half, while the pair distance is 1 minus P times D. So the work that we get is like this. This is worse than what we had before, but you can say, okay, this is sort of a general worst case thing. So, well, we might have something worse. Now, let's take the sparse problem. So here, the, we, have, we, have, we have those metrics. So two, two random ones 
each, each one of them will, be, will have two epsilon ones, and there will be little intersection because epsilon is small. So the distance would be about four epsilon d. While two correct ones, each, each, each will have two epsilon two, but epsilon of them would be the same. So the distance would be about two epsilon d, so the ratio c is two, which brings a work like this. And notice that there is no factor that drives this to one when, when epsilon goes to zero. So I'd say that this is uh, quite unacceptable. Now, of course, so one can say that, all right, this is because uh, this is a, 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 and it is a very general bound under worst conditions, but maybe when we look at the actual method, things work better. Now, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I really did my best to look and see which methods they recommend. So I went uh, and Googled locality sensitive hashing, and uh, there they point a paper, uh, locality sensitive hashing scheme based on piece table distributions. I look in there, and uh, there is a particular method they recommend exactly for sparse data. So uh, I, I, I believe I, I, I did my best to see uh, the, the, the recommended thing, and it is quite a clever scheme. What it does, instead of uh, looking at coordinates, it uh, does render projection. The, the idea goes to the johnson uh, linder strauss theorem, but uh, here, instead of uh, using um, no, normal or discrete variables, they are using uh, Cauchy variables, see? which have a distribution without variance. And uh, the reason why they're using them is because uh, they, they go well with uh, the L1 matrix. And uh, so, so what they do is that for each sequence, they're taking and, and computing a sort of a, a signature, which is one bit that is computed out of the whole sequence by taking combination of values and, look, and looking at the sign of the thing. And uh, you, you need to take again k of these random signatures with different values, project into the buckets and see what happens. Um, now, the idea of random projection seems uh, ve very uh, compelling. You start with a problem in um, 20,000 dimensions, you do a random projection, you have now a problem in 20 dimensions with the distance structure about the same. This is what the theory guarantees, and this is what is actually delivered. Could anything be wrong with that? Well, if what we were to do is to go choose pairs of points and compute distances, then there is nothing wrong with that. The distance that we would get in the 20,000 dimensions is about the same as the distance that we will get in the 20 dimensions, and everything is fine. However, notice that the methods that we did before, did we go just to pick pairs of points and compute their distances? No. We looked at particular coordinates. Now, once you go and do a random projection, those coordinates are lost forever. Now, the effect that it has is quite dramatic. So, I, f I think that I, I, would, I wouldn't go now through the details. They are written and they are not very complicated. But it turns out that this particular method on this uh, example has performance not only that this doesn't tend to one, it's even worse than what we had before. Now, I actually heard from three different people independent who tried the, the random projection approach, not necessarily uh, using uh, Cauchy variables, but the, this thing doesn't, doesn't depend on, on the Cauchy. And each one of them found that it didn't work. This is why. Any questions about that? Does that, does that result depend on how many of these bits you projected down into? If you project to a large number, you have a problem that resembles
equals the original problem would have the same bounds? Um, it's uh, no, it, it, it doesn't matter much what. What matters is how you do the projection. If, if by doing it you go and you scramble your bits, then uh, th things are bad. Uh, of, of, of course, if, if, you, if you compute a one, one projection to a large number of bits and do it in a non-scrambling way, then this is fine. But uh, this, this is again the, the approach that, uh, that we started off. The idea of going and uh, combining all sorts of coordinates together, by summing them up, is the destructive thing. And, and if you think of it, it's, it's quite obvious, actually. How could they think otherwise? Um, all right. So the, the, this was a sort of negative part. And, be, and, and believe me, this is the, this is the sort of thing that, that, that I can't avoid because it is the reigning theory. Now, the way I prefer things is taking the probabilistic model of having a matrix. Now, it's not necessarily two by two. And I, and I, and I have a data that is randomly generated by it. And, and I have a certain pair, or could be many pairs. It doesn't matter. That are related. The others are not related. And it's a question of uh, what we can do under the circumstances. Now, the general question of what we can do is, uh, is just too difficult. I mean, if, if I were able to prove that any algorithm here couldn't do better than something non-trivial, then uh, for me to prove that uh, P is uh, different than NP would be quite simple. Since it isn't, no, I will not do this. So I must restrict my class of algorithms. I can't allow just everything. The class of algorithms that I consider are, well, the sort of the things that we saw before, bucketing algorithms. Meaning I have buckets, I throw things into buckets. Now, all, all the algorithms that uh, are actually practiced are bucketing algorithms. However, I insist not just that I have bucketing algorithms, but that I have the buckets fixed in advance, independent of the data. Now, many algorithms uh, actually construct the buckets using the data. Now, I, I cannot prove things about, about this situation because uh, you could do a very complicated construction and then, who knows, by miracle, things work. I certainly couldn't prove that they wouldn't. Uh, However, when you have random data, I'd say that using the data in order to generate the, the buckets doesn't seem to, to give much value. Because uh, if, if, think, as, as long as um, we, are, we, are, we are not using our special pair and you are using everything else, then everything else is just random. You might as well have a fixed bucket. So the only game that we have is by how this special pair affects the bucket. The intuition is that it doesn't help much, but uh, of course I can't prove such a thing. All right, so what does the bucketing algorithm mean? I have a list of buckets. Now here, the buckets are actually pairs because this is, this is an, another uh, generalization. In, instead of having just a single set of sequences, I have, say, two sets, and I want to compute pairs between one and the other. Now, th this, uh, this allows also to consider a non-symmetric problem when we have a large set and a small set. So uh, when I'm taking buckets, I, I'm allowing buckets in one sequence and buckets in another sequence. Now, an example of why this sort of thing uh, would be necessary is that um, f f think uh, if, if you have a really general problem, you could have that a special pair are anti-correlated, where one of them is one, the other one tends to be zero. In order to design buckets there, of course, the buckets for the one and the buckets for the other must be different. 
Otherwise, there is no way. So, so in general, I'm really forced to do this. Now, so I have a list of buckets. And also, before I describe the, the bucketing procedure as composed of tries. I do first try, throw into buckets, do second try, etc. Here the description is that I put all the tries together. Here is the all list of buckets. I go and try on them. All right. Now, what are the properties of such a thing? First of all, there is some success probability. And that just that if I'm, if I'm looking on those, those sets, the probability that uh, my, my pair would fall into them, this, this is a success probability. I have, the, I have f probability that both of them fall into this bucket or into this bucket or into that bucket. This, is, this, this union is the set that I succeed and its probability, this is a success probability. This is obvious. Now, the work probability is a bit less obvious. I have here this expression. What does it mean? Now, this, I have, I have n0 is the number in one set, n1 the number in the other set. You can just think of them both as equal to n uh, if you don't want to think of different sets. So n0, the probability of bucket 0, how many elements of the set 1 I expect to fall into, into this bucket? This, the number that I expect to its companion. So the multiplication is the number of comparisons. Adding all these things is the total number of comparisons. So this is, this is certainly an element of the work necessary. However, this is not the only thing. If we allowed only this, we could make very, very, very small buckets and do it seems a little work. There is another work of just throwing things into buckets. How so this is how, how, how many elements are thrown into, this, into the first bucket. And we have to, su and we have to sum. Because even if, if we do things and we don't succeed in order to match pairs, we still have to throw them in. So all this expression is certainly a lower bound. Um, now, can, can such a thing be realized? Now, th th this, this thing is real. This is just a number of comparisons. But throwing things into buckets, it, mi it might be necessary to do more work. You can, you can think of, uh, of an algorithm that uh, you, you have a prepared list for each element to which bucket it belongs. You see an element, you make a lookup, and that's it. Then this is really, really the amount of work necessary. But this is a bit cheating because uh, the, num the, the list, the, the size is, is exponential in n. So in order to realize such a thing, we actually need to do a sort of a tensor product. Make a, make a projection depending not on the, all the coordinates, but on some of them. Make a projection on the others, etc., and combine them in a tensor product. And then such a thing can be approximated. Mm. At least I hope that the, the idea that such a thing is an absolute lower bound uh, should be clear, hopefully. Um, all right, and now the result. And this is something that I find uh, quite surprising. Now, I wrote the information theory bound that the thing that we had before so that we can compare. So now, I remember that before we had D times the information. Now I allow that to have different matrices in each place. So to generalization. Then the information bound this, the log of the number of possible pairs minus the available information. When this is negative, we have enough information in order to determine which is the correct pair. Now, this is my result. It says that the amount of work is supremum over some things, of something that depends 
on the size of the sets, the success probability, and I have to subtract information functions. Now, this information function dep depends on the matrix, but it has three parameters. And with particular values of these parameters, it is the same as the original information function. This expression certainly takes some time to get used to. First of all, notice that though it's quite complicated, it's neat in the sense there are no funny constants. There is no big O, little o, C, not even 2.3. Everything is just right. Now, <laughs> yes? Can you use infinity? Mm -hmm. Well, you can say that you use infinity when s is 1. Probability success is, is 1. Now, in, in actuality, uh, in order to ensure probability of success 1, you would, it's necessary to do a, a large amount of work, say n squared. So, uh, uh, it, the realistic thing is to, p to put S not 1, but say 1 minus 1 over N or something. And then mu wouldn't be infinity, it would be just something large. Now, what's the meaning of, uh, of, the, of this sort of, uh, of statement? Now, we have lots of pieces of information coming from the different coordinates. So now think that uh, we, have, we have this bunch of bits and uh, think of it as sort of given, fixed thing. For this fixed thing, we have those fixed parameters. And now ju just look at how making a small change in here changes the behavior of the expression. So for instance, if we increase this, this, the size of, of the set from n0 to 2n0, what happens to, to the work? It increases by a factor of 2 to the lambda 0. So this lambda 0 is actually the exponent of showing how the work increases with the size of the first set. Now, the, again, this, how it increases with the second set, mu how, we, how it uh, behaves when, when, you are, when we are changing the requirements of, uh, for success. And this is how much we gain from each piece of information. Now, the how much we gain is a bit tricky because think of the situation that we have lots, lots of data when this sort of goes to infinity. Then, each particular piece of data has very, very little value. Not only that each one of them goes to zero, the sum altogether would go to zero too because the information that you have in each one coordinate is almost contained in the others. So it's in that situation when these large, the, the meaning of, of, this, of all this expression is really the question of for which values of lambda this information goes to zero, this information function. Of course, you could have data of, of different qualities. So, so you could have some, some pieces of data. For them, the information has a, non, a, a, a large value, and they reduce the amount of work considerably. Now, it's not necessary to work with all those parameters. You could take the n0 equal n1, lambda 0 equal 1, lambda 1, and they take uh, the mu large towards infinity, and you are left with sort of one parameter. But, but one parameter is necessary. It cannot go and be just like that. Now, this is a lower bound. And there is also a statement that this is asymptotically correct in some sense. So the, the way it's proven is also a bit reminiscent of uh, information theory that uh, the lower bound is proven by sort of information-like inequality. 
And the upper bound, the claim that we can achieve such a thing, is by constructing a random bucketing code. So uh, I, I will show in a very cursory way the, the idea behind the, the construction, the proof, and then I'll try to answer questions. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not a simple thing, so it certainly takes time to get used to. Now, the, this information function is not a simple thing, not a surprise by now, though uh, the expression does have a sort of beauty of its own. Um, the a kullback li libre divergence, or you can just say the entropy distance, plays here a, a, ve a very large role. This is a sort of very information theoretic expression, and it goes here to a, a large extent. Now, how such a thing um, is, uh, is proven? So in order to get the idea, just, just le let us take the, the case when you have lots of data. And then the inequality, this is also a quite an interesting inequality, that the work is less than or equal, success probability times powers of the size of sets. So, when we take this example and we ask, use, plugging those things, how well we can do, turns out that instead of uh, what we had n to the log base 2 of 2 over p, we can approach n to the power of 1 over p. And that's the optimal power. Another thing uh, is that uh, if we have an unbalanced set, one size n1, the other of a smaller size, n1 to a smaller power, and when this power is small enough, we can do with a linear amount of work. Also quite a surprise. How, how are, are these things done? So the construction, so for instance, in this case, uh, as I said, it's just done by random buckets. We are, ch we are choosing a ra rand random points, drawing a, a humming ball around them that contains about one nth of the data. So this is, this is the basic thing, and we have to do tensor products of this. And it works. So the same approach of building random codes in information theory works in here too. In the more general matrix, the construction is more elaborate, but again, it's a random construction. As for the inequality, how such an inequality is proven? So the cru crucial step is showing that if the information function is zero for two matrices, then uh, it, it's equivalent for it being zero on their tensor product. This is working some inequalities. None of them is, is complicated, but there are some of them. So this is not a thing to present here. And then, in, in order to prove the sort of thing I want to, this, this, by the way, is a thing of, of interest by itself. Look at this inequality. What it says is that um, the probability of having a, a rectangle, of a rectangle is less than or equal products of, the prob the, of its marginal probabilities to some parameters that have a relation between them. If you know of the Talagrand inequalities or other probability inequalities, 
you will find uh, this, this sort of thing interesting. And this uh, is proven now very simply, and that's the idea that we had before, that, that we showed that from the information of a, a, a single matrix, I get information of the tensor product. Then I can just look at the tensor product and, and reduce to dimension one, insert into the definition, and I get the inequality immediately. And then there is another, I, w I won't go through this, but th this is all what's left. Very, very simple and neat inequality. Mm. So this is uh, es es essentially it. Um, as, as, as you get there, there are certainly uh, no, non-trivial non uh, details. The information function is not, uh, is not simple to compute. It's not like what we had the information that there is just uh, a, for a formula involving logarithms. Here it's a thing that you really need to run a small, a small uh, computer program to compute. But it is, it is computable and uh, it, it gives bounds as to what you can achieve with uh, using buckets and no matter what you do. So th all, th all this thing is a sort of a parallel information theory, more, more complicated than the standard information theory, valid for uh, this particular case. So I, I got at the end, I have a list of uh, bibliography if uh, people are interested in the, in the theory of these things, but uh, First, questions. Questions. Well, I don't interpret this as that I made everything clear. Uh, well. The typical nearest neighbor problem would be, say, finding duplicate videos. You have a big database that we compute locality, locality sensitive patches on as we get them. And then when we get a new video, we compute the buckets for that one and then we'll try to figure out if there's one in there that it's close to. So that's like your unbalanced set problem where you've got a set of size one and a set of size n zero. You try to find if there's one match to that one new. Uh, yes, but uh, in this situation, the, the large set is being pre-processed. Right. Now the question is if you, if you have such a scheme where you, and it seems to me like that's one of the big advantages of the whole LSH thing is that you can reprocess so that the queries become fast. Um, is that the right interpretation? And, and how much work is there if the, if the buckets have all been pre-computed? How much work is it to compare that one new thing to that large set? Is it... Uh, um, um, it, uh, it, it's, 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 still, uh, it's still fine. Uh, the, 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 ba the bounds that, that you have, if you, if you divide by n, it would still be the work of finding uh, one using the pre-computation. However, the way, the way it's presented here, the, the amount of, uh, of data that you have to keep is very large. So, you, so usually when you have the situation that you pre-compute things, it's important for you that the pre-computation will result in a co compact data, not uh, much larger th th than the original, while this uh, can violate it. Um, and uh, the, the, this is uh, a certainly a, a, a drawback of uh, this general approach. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks uh, for coming to hear me.